As I said at the early service today, they just got back from a bell choir convention last night in uh, Ocean City, but they say they never saw the ocean. Uh, you are in Ocean City because the hotel rooms are cheap in Ocean City at this time of year, but uh, thanks for your ministry. Uh, good morning and welcome to St. Andrew. It is a great day to know the Lord and to rejoice in the goodness of God in this fourth Sunday of Lent. And so we welcome you in his name. We also welcome uh, those who are joining us via live stream today and wish you the blessings of Christ from wherever you are. Uh, we invite you to make contact with us uh, using the contact cards in front of you in the pew racks if we can serve you more personally uh, through St. Andrew's life and ministry. We certainly wanna know how to do that and you can place those into the offering plate or into the hands of our ushers later on in the service. Join us after service for some refreshments and. Uh, fellowship out in the uh, commons and for all of the goings on uh, in the coming days here in our life together. I uh, want to remind you as always that in addition to our three services on Sunday, we worship on Monday evening every week uh, at seven o'clock with uh, the celebration of Holy Communion. And then uh, we invite you to join us also uh, this coming Wednesday as our series of midweek Lenten services uh, continues. Uh, soup suppers uh, begin at six o'clock in the commons and then uh, worship here at seven o'clock. Walks with Jesus uh, continue. Uh, this week, uh, we will hear about the walk of uh, Dr. Bruce Hartung, uh, our fellow member, uh, Professor Emeritus and uh, Dean of Ministerial Formation at uh, Concordia Seminary in St. Louis about his own walk and his experience in uh, encouraging others to walk with Jesus in life and ministry. I think you'll find it very compelling uh, once again. Hope to see you on Wednesday evening. Also tomorrow, we will gather here at uh, church for the funeral service for Marv Waking. 11 a.m. is uh, service time here in the sanctuary. I also wanna say thanks for those of you who participated in the Mana Food Drive uh, last week, uh, another big success. And uh, so we are grateful for uh, your assistance for the good of uh, folks in need here in Montgomery County. Uh, many of you already caught the uh, Craft Ministry spl Spring Fling. It's a one-day sale uh, in anticipation of Easter. If you didn't, you can stop uh, in the Commons and check that out uh, on your way. A few other things in the blue notes uh, to highlight. Ukraine support, some new information about that. Uh, they're also, uh, ready or not, registration for Vacation Bible School is underway. That's uh, June 26 through 30. And then on uh, Easter, uh, Saturday, Holy Saturday, uh, we will have our annual God's House Easter Egg Roll here at uh, church. If you would like to volunteer uh, with uh, help for the distribution of thousands of eggs and uh, other things, get in touch with Robin Howland, our Director of Children's Ministries, and uh, she'll be happy to uh, help you with that. Uh, today we want to say uh, farewell and Godspeed to Sonia Domsky, longtime member of our congregation. Uh, heading down to Texas uh, to live with family. Sonia, blessings to you and thank you for your uh, life and, and good ministry among us. You're sitting almost in your usual seat today. And uh, so we are very grateful for uh, your witness. Let's give God the glory for Sonia. Uh, in our prayers today, uh, we surround our brother Alan Jocks, uh, uh, children, uh, Jeff and Lisa and all their family at the passing of our fellow member, uh, Jan Jocks, uh, last Thursday into uh, the near presence of God. Uh, the funeral service uh, will take place here at St. Andrew on Wednesday the 29th, that's a week from Wednesday, uh, viewing at 10 o'clock here at the church with funeral service at 10.30. More information about that will be uh, forthcoming, but uh, uh, we extend to you the hand of Christian sympathy along with our bond of love and prayers as you uh, give thanks for uh, that uh, good and blessed woman uh, now in the presence of her Savior. And so blessings to all of you in your worship and in all of your life as we now rise for the order of confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, 
we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Redeemer, in our weakness we have failed to be your messengers of forgiveness and hope in the world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit that we may follow your commands and proclaim your reign of love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We listen to the word of the Lord for our encouragement today. The first lesson is from the prophecy of Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, beginning at the first verse. And it is read this morning by Dolph Lykebush. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them, 
and there were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded. And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked. And there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place on you your own and I will place you on your own soil, then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The second lesson is written in the letter of Saint Paul to the Romans, the eighth chapter, beginning at the sixth verse and is read this morning by Mary Beth Beatty. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his Spirit that dwells in you. We honor the Lord by rising to sing. Gospel according to St. John, the 11th chapter. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was ill. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, 
I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated as we sing together the hymn of the day. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So for the last 72 hours, uh, some of the most exciting and intense sports action has taken place. Every year around this time, people from all around the country tune in to what some might say is the most exciting weekend in sports. Beginning this past Thursday for the men and Friday for the women was the NCAA Basketball Tournament of Champions, or as everyone else in the world calls it, March Madness. And whether your favorite team made it in or is, you know, a number two seed, go Terps women, or because you entered your, graphic, your office's bracket challenge, or maybe you're just watching for fun, I think it's fair to say it's a bit of an exciting weekend. And while I typically watch as many games as I can, uh, this year I just wasn't thinking about it over the course of the last few months, and so I didn't know when the weekend was going to come when Pastor Mark came in the preaching schedule a few months ago. So rather than watch basketball for the last three days, I was working on this message. But I did manage to catch a few games, including the one uh, that started the men's tournament on Thursday, which, as I'm sure many of you know, was the game between the University of West Virginia and the University of Maryland. And uh, it was a pretty close game the whole way, and it came down really to the last few plays. And in the last 30 seconds, uh, there was a really controversial moment. So controversial, in fact, that the refs had to go back to the replay monitor to try and watch it and make sure that they got the call right. 
Eventually they did and Maryland went on to win. But just so we're clear, their victory has nothing to do with the rest of this message, okay? But you know, go Lady Terps later today. But I mention all of this because as I was watching the game, and particularly uh, that moment where they were watching the same play over and over and over again, that moment kind of stood out to me. Just uh, this idea in which uh, the referees wanted to make sure that they got this right, that they understood everything that had happened. And so they watched the replay again and again and again from different angles each time, a second and third and fourth time, just to see if maybe they missed something, as if somehow something new might come out of it. And I think the reason I've been really uh, thinking about that moment in particular over the last few days is because that's what I want all of us to do this morning in light of the story we heard from John's Gospel. See, the story uh, that you heard just a few moments ago is actually a section of a larger story that comes out of John. Uh, the story that is all familiar to us, uh, the raising of Lazarus. Uh, many of us have heard this story over the years. It's one of the most famous and well-known stories in the Bible. I remember as a kid hearing it in Sunday school and knowing that, wow, Lazarus is the man that Jesus raised from the dead. In fact, uh, I think when I was a kid, I vividly remember that our, for Sunday school, our activity was to wrap each other in toilet paper because that's what we assume Lazarus walked out of the tomb looking like. And so at the very least, when we hear that name, Lazarus, many of us immediately jump to, oh yeah, that's the guy that Jesus raised from the dead. But just like any other story in the Bible, it's important for us to go back and to read the story again and again and again, kind of like watching a replay. Because when we do that, we begin to see Jesus on every single line. The Spirit works within us to perhaps catch things that maybe we missed the first or the second or even the third time. And it helps us to experience even the most familiar of stories in a new way. And so as we replay the story this morning, I want to go back to a time in which Jesus hadn't even arrived at the tomb of Lazarus. I want to pause the story at a really powerful moment. It's the moment where Martha meets Jesus. And that name Martha might sound familiar to you as well. She was one of Lazarus' sisters, though uh, we often perhaps compare her to her other sister, Mary. In fact, even as this story opens up, we're told it's Mary who's the one who anoints the feet of Jesus. And in the other story, we know that Martha is the one preparing the house while Jesus is there, and, and Mary is just sitting listening to Jesus teach. Right, so it's, it's that Martha who's here in this story. And together, Mary and Martha's brother Lazarus is sick. And so they send word to Jesus, and they do it in a really uh, particular way. And verse 3 tells us that they said, Lord, he whom you love is ill. And so uh, it's clear that Jesus cared deeply for all of them, but at the same time, these sisters are trying to send a, a bit of a not-so-subtle message here to Jesus. The one that you care for, the one that you love, he is ill. And of course, as the story goes, and as we hear in verse 17, Jesus doesn't just show up. In fact, uh, we're, not, we're told until it's four days after Lazarus has already been in the tomb that Jesus finally arrives. So when the sisters initially sent word to Jesus, Lazarus was still alive but very sick. And now that he's been dead for four days, that's when Jesus finally shows up. So we already can see that there's a bit of a gap in that time span, in the time in which they reached out and the time in which Lazarus has been dead. And so when Martha finally hears that Jesus is here, she goes out to greet him on the road when he arrives. And here's what she says to him. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Over the last few days, I found myself reflecting on these words from Martha. Her words here are so clearly filled with so much emotion. She's certainly feeling the grief of the loss of her brother that she's been carrying now for at least four days. And on top of that, based on what we know about Martha, I think we can all assume that she was also exhausted from all the people that she's hosting because they're coming to love on her and her sister now that her brother has died. And so in the midst of, of the emotional exhaustion and perhaps the physical exhaustion, she comes to Jesus and when she speaks to him, there's this, this tension found in his, her words to him. See, uh, this tension is found as she wrestles with the depth of her faith in him, and at the same time, her frustration with the lack of his presence. She knows that if Jesus had shown up sooner, 
Lazarus would not be dead. Uh, Martha clearly communicates here that she believes if Jesus was there, he would have healed her brother. Martha believes that Jesus can heal and can restore. But that's not the reality of her situation. The reality is her brother has been dead for four days. Jesus was late. And now she has to carry the weight of that grief with her every day. How often do you look back on a moment in your life and wish that things could be different? What are the moments that you find yourself replaying and perhaps you ask, why did this have to happen to me? Maybe like Martha, you look back on a moment in which you experienced a deep sense of grief, a very painful loss, the loss of a loved one, a life-changing grief in which you find yourself asking, what if things were different? Or even more pointedly, as Martha did, what if Jesus had been here when I called on him? Where was Jesus when I needed him? I think many of us have experienced what Martha's going through here, wondering how things might have been different if Jesus was there in the moments that we called on him. And so often it's these moments, just like Martha's, it's the moments of our deepest need, of our, our deepest regrets, of our deepest pain, of our deepest sorrow and sadness. Moments that are filled with losses that change our lives forever. And we can't help but wonder, where were you, Jesus? Why didn't you do something? Oh, why didn't you come when I called on you? Lord, if, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In the depth of our grief, we feel as though Jesus simply hasn't arrived yet. That, that perhaps there's a part of us that knows that he's here, but we still wish he would have arrived just to change what went wrong. That if anyone could have done anything, if someone could have changed the outcome, it's Jesus. And now, we're simply left looking back on all that has been lost, wondering what would have changed if he was here. And at the same time, Martha has a unique perspective that appears to us in this story. See, because while she looks back on what has been lost, she also communicates a very clear vision of what is still yet to come. And this comes on the heels of what Jesus says to her. That after she says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died, Jesus says to her, Martha, your brother will rise again. And then Martha says to him, I know that he will rise again on the resurrection at the last day. And so if Martha's first words were communicating that she has this deep sense of loss and perhaps frustration with, with Jesus not showing up, she also is very aware that the resurrection will change everything, that her focus can now be completely shifted to the future. And I think as readers, we often overlook this interaction between Martha and Jesus because we know how the story ends. Right? We, we jump ahead to the part in the story where Jesus calls Lazarus out and he comes out. And yet, in this moment here, we overlook one of the most powerful proclamations that Jesus has for me and for you. A moment that we can also lean on someone like Martha. That Martha's faith shines through here. That in her words here, Martha is proclaiming the power of the resurrection. That in the midst of her grief and looking back on what she's lost, she's also very aware of all that is still yet to come. She believes that on the last day she will be reunited with her brother Lazarus. In the midst of her pain and in her sorrow, she still has uh, this, this reality that promises her that one day things will be better. One day things will be different. The power of the resurrection will change her life. And this gives her hope in the midst of her grief. Hope that, that death is not the end and that there is something for her to look forward to every day of her earthly life. So what are you most looking forward to at the resurrection of Jesus? Maybe it's uh, the experience where there will be no more pain and no more sorrow. Maybe uh, you're looking forward to experiencing all that the new creation has to offer you. Maybe you're looking forward to meeting Jesus. And, and I know that almost sounds like it, it's an added thing, but isn't that something that we all long for? Or maybe you're like Martha, 
Uh, Looking forward to all those things, but in particular, being reunited with the loved ones who have gone on before you as we celebrate the resurrection for all of eternity. See, in the midst of her interaction with Jesus here, Martha is experiencing this tension between her past and her future. And her experience teaches us how to embrace the resurrection in light of this tension, in light of what has happened and what will happen. Because she knows things could have been different, but she's aware that things one day will be different. She knows the power of the resurrection and that she will experience it one day in its fullness, but for now, she has to wait. See, as Martha meets Jesus on that road that day, she's on a bit of a longer road, the road to resurrection. And that is true not only for Martha, but for me and for you. That this is how so many of us live our lives each and every day. We look back on what we have lost, wondering what could have been, acutely aware of our pain and of our sorrow. And at the same time, we look forward, knowing that God has promised us a life that is full of future eternal blessings and promise and hope, and one day, the fullness of life experienced with him and all those who have gone on before us. And while this is every bit of a faithful and faith-filled response from Martha and from me and from you, Jesus wants us to know that there's more to life than just the past and the future. Listen again to what he says. I am the resurrection and the life. In the midst of, of Martha focusing on her past life and on the future that Jesus has in store for her, he comes to speak words of hope into her present. In fact, if you look at the old manuscripts, it's very clear that these words are in the present tense, that as Jesus speaks them, he wants Martha to know that this is her reality right here and right now. He's not speaking about the power in the past or the future. Jesus speaks these words to Martha to invite her into that reality right now. That Jesus is telling her he is the resurrection and the life. And that means her life is different in this moment. Because remember, all of this is happening before he's arrived at the tomb. Lazarus has not been raised from the dead yet. The big miraculous moment hasn't come And yet Jesus wants Martha to know that right now, even with her brother dead, in the midst of her great sorrow, the resurrection has come to her. That the power of the resurrection is here now and is always with her. So often we think about our lives just like like Martha did. We think about our lives and about Jesus and about the resurrection as if it could have changed something in our past and it will change everything about our future. And both of those are true. But when Jesus speaks here, he wants us to know that the resurrection has meaning in our lives right here and right now. What Jesus teaches Martha and me and you in this moment is that no body has to exit the tomb for us to participate in the resurrection. Jesus is is showing us that the power of the resurrection is already at work. And so we don't need to hide our pain and our suffering and our sorrow. We don't need to to put those things away as if uh, God doesn't want them. We can take them back to him. Because in the midst of her sorrow and in her grief, in the midst of your sorrow and your grief, Jesus steps in and says to you, I am the resurrection and the life. Right here and right now, the promises of the resurrection are true for me and for you. You know, it's fitting that Jesus speaks these words to us today while we are in the midst of our own resurrection journey. In the midst of the season of Lent, where uh, for the last 25 days and for the next 15, we'll continue on this long road in which we talk about the depth of our sinfulness and of our brokenness and how the result of all of those things leads to death and the loss that we experience in this life. And at the same time, we're called to focus on all the promises and the power that Jesus has in the midst of those moments. That Jesus steps into the darkness, he steps into the pain and the sorrow and the heartbreak to bring these promises to us here and now. He speaks those words of promise to me and you the same way he did to Martha. 
And the beauty of these words is that they come while we are still waiting for the full celebration of the resurrection. That rather than rush ahead to Easter, we still have some time to sit and in a few weeks to walk that walk, the journey to the cross where Jesus will die for me and for you. And three days later to the tomb where it will be empty and he will rise for me and for you. And yet right here, in the midst of that walk, Jesus proclaims the resurrection. And he shows us that the resurrection promises are not just for the past and they're not just for the future. They're not far away from us. The resurrection promises are here right now for me and for you. When Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, he invites us to embrace that in this moment, to embrace that in the present moments of our lives. To embrace the resurrection because it has the power to change everything about our lives and that power is being experienced each and every day. That in every moment in our lives, the resurrection is already changing how we see the world, how we live, how we exist. Everything about our lives is changed because of the resurrection. But what does this look like then for me and for you? How do we experience the power of the resurrection in our daily lives? Sometimes, perhaps, it's through the big, grandiose moments like Lazarus walking out of the tomb. But more often, it's in the small, quiet ways. It's, in fact, uh, through the way that we interact with one another, that we experience the power of the resurrection through the people that God has placed in our lives. That sometimes the power of the resurrection comes through something as simple as a hug or maybe uh, the holding of a hand. Maybe speaking those words of peace to one another. Perhaps wiping a tear. Maybe even just sitting in silence to be reminded that the tomb is silent because it is empty. In the midst of our daily lives, in every moment, Jesus comes to say, I am the resurrection and the life. He wants you to know that wherever you are on this long road to resurrection, that he has come to you here and now. That he is the resurrection and the life even in the midst of your pain and in your sorrow. And he promises to come to you at every moment and each and every day to fill you with his hope and to continue to fill you with his love. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we continue in worship, I invite the congregation to stand. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ Jesus, living together in trust and in hope. We confess our faith together saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we journey through these blessed and holy days, let us pray. Gracious and holy God, as you have breathed into us the breath of life, enliven your church, lift up our voices, encourage our praise, and use us to embody your presence, that through our witness in action, example, and in words, all people may come to know your only Son as the resurrection and the life for all the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you that your spirit of life dwells in this beloved assembly. Encourage us to speak well of one another and of you. Correct us when our words are unfair and unkind, Unite us together in a bond of love and support and let your light shine through us to every heart 
that together we may joyfully celebrate our new life in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive our thanks for the life of your servant, Jan Jocks, and for her eternal rest in our crucified and risen Lord. Comfort your servants, Alan, Jeff, Lisa, all their family and all who mourn Jan's passing, and rejoice that she is now forever secure in your nearer presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be present, O God, with those who are troubled by illness, and especially your servants, Dick Whitmer, Art Williams, Rita Knudsen, Mary Woodcheck, Frida Massey, Jeff Toby, Wendell Hinton, and all who we name before you in our hearts, that they may be free from despair and live by your grace in their suffering and healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Go with our sister, Sonia Domsky, as she relocates to open a new chapter in her life and keep us united with her in a bond of gratitude for our blessed years together and for the love of Christ, which is greater than time and space. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain those who have suffered the atrocities of war, who endure hardship, and all who live in the pathway of violent weather. Ease the social and political tensions that threaten our common good, and raise up servants and leaders who will work to promote the dignity and the value of every human life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you all. You. May be seated as we worship the Lord with our tithes and our Sunday offerings. God is in this place and comes to us with a foretaste of the feast that is yet to come in Christ our Lord. As I invite you to rise for the celebration of Holy Communion on page six. The Lord be with you. Lift 
up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord. Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, you bid your people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. Renew our zeal in faith and life and bring us to the fullness of grace that belongs to the children of God. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are... On the night before our Lord gave his life for us, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Taught by our Lord, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace to the day of everlasting life. Amen. We rise for prayer. Compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Send us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be a hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace, and our prayer a song of grateful hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. May God, who has called us from the dust of the earth and claimed us as children of the light, strengthen you on your journey into life renewed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Marked with the cross of Christ, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>